Crescent Oaks has quickly become one of the Bay Area's go-to golf destinations. The 6,800-yard track takes players through a natural preserve and offers a true championship challenge from the back tees. For those looking for a casual, more fun round, the forward tees offer a more forgiving and fair challenge. The Oaks design is unique in that it eschews traditional parkland features, instead opting for a marsh lynx hybrid, meaning the fairways here are firm and fast and riddled with hollows, while tall cypress trees and freshwater preserves present more penal obstacles along the way, paired with a thoughtful hole design that encourages aggression but also offers a safer alternative for those less daring, it's easy to see why Crescent Oaks' reputation is on the rise. This is Every Hole at Crescent Oaks Country Club. The first hole is a uniquely tight tee shot for an opener, but that's for good reason. This was actually the 10th hole originally, but the nines were switched in order to create a more dramatic finisher. Driver isn't necessary here and likely too much club. Three wood may even be too much for some. The goal here is simple, just get it in the fairway and ideally somewhere on the right side. Cause from here you have an unobstructed view to the green that's two tiered and bisected by a knob that gets its origins from the bunker that guards the entrance short and left. It's bombs away on this sprawling par 5 that doesn't punish wayward drives, but it does, however, reward accurately, with the potential for a mid-iron to an unprotected green. There's no water in play and plenty of land all around, so there's really no benefit to laying up here. The green is divided into two distinct flat sections by a ridge that runs between the two bunkers that straddle the putting surface. It's better to be below the hole here than above. The third is a longer par three that appears to be all carry at first glance, but upon further inspection, one can see that the water ends roughly 15 yards short of the putting surface. While there's plenty of room long and right, it's better to be below the hole on this one for your birdie putt than long, as the green has a general back to front slope. Number four is a not quite drivable par four, and it favors a fade if you have it. The dogleg right has two bunkers that straddle the fairway, but don't really come into play. The hole can be a drive and a chip. However, many savvy locals opt to hang back for a fuller swing into this green. Two trees frame the putting surface, and their shade creates often skinny lies for wedges that happen to be sculled to that side of the green. And as the fairway comes closer to the green, it becomes slightly more steep, making the chance of thinning your wedge even greater the further down the fairway you are. We transition from not quite drivable to absolutely certainly is drivable on the short par four fifth hole. The bunkers on the left side of the fairway are more decorative than functional. The real threat here comes from the pair of bunkers that split the neck of the entrance of the fairway. Each present different challenges, the one on the right, a 40 yard sand shot most players don't have, and the one on the left will almost certainly leave you short sighted. However, the entrance is wide enough to where players shouldn't be discouraged from going for the green. It's on the bridge and through the woods and we're off to number six, a long par five that gives players fits. Now from the tee box, it appears as if the fairway opens up to the right as the trees start to end. However, that is an illusion, as these trees obscure a body of water that have a gravitational pull for shots that are faded to the right side of the fairway. Depending on how far down the fairway you go will dictate what your second shot is. If you hit a great shot down the left or center, you're likely going to be able to go for it in two, and that body of water won't pose much of a threat. However, if you didn't hit it far down the fairway, don't be ashamed to lay up. That water has a tendency to eat up long irons and metals that aren't struck and lofted into the air. There's no shame in having 160 yards out, as opposed to being in one of the other bunkers 
at awkward distances that surround the green. Wedge check. The seventh isn't a test of accuracy and is surprisingly forgiving for shots that go left or right, as the putting surface is pretty broad in those directions. However, if you don't dial in your distance, the consequences for being wrong are drastic. If you go long, there is a chance it kicks back and rolls into the hazard. Anything short could roll into either bunker that dots the hillside short, or worse, into the water here. Possibly the most apt way to describe number eight is demanding. The tee shot requires you hit a drive and you gotta hit it straight because anything that goes left or right could be a full stroke penalty. And if you manage to find the fairway, you're rewarded with an uneven lie as the whole fairway is crumpled. The second shot's gonna be a mid iron to a green. And if you go long, balls have a tendency to roll into the hazard there. And the forest left is closer than it appears. The only safety is if you happen to bail out right. So play a fade if you have it. From here, it could be an uphill chip or putt. Get your par, and that's a better score than birdie on most holes. The ninth offers a reprieve in the way of a stress-free tee shot in stark contrast to number eight. It's possibly the widest fairway on the course. Maybe number 10 competes with it. Hazards don't really come into play and that bunker is very easy to avoid. From the fairway or the short grass, wherever you happen to be, the green is still going to be unobstructed, making this an ideal pin-seeking hole. This is a great chance for a birdie from wherever you are in the fairway. <laughs> 